Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending upon where in the world you are. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for our webinar today. Uh, we will be talking about multi-channel attribut attribution, understanding your customer touch points to make sure that every dollar goes further. Uh, I am Alexandra Gibson, the Chief Growth Officer at Guten, and I will be uh, joined today by AJ Brown, who is the CEO and co-founder at LeadsRx. So really excited to learn from him today. And um, he has some tremendous insights and I think uh, that we will all uh, gain a lot from his knowledge. So a couple of quick housekeeping items. We're recording this, so uh, you'll get a link to the recording either later today or tomorrow. Um, any questions? please feel free to type directly into the chat panel on the right. Uh, we will answer most of those at the end, but uh, my colleague Frank is also on the line, so he will uh, jump in at any point um, if there are questions pertaining to something we're, we're talking about right at the moment. Uh, and the last piece is, uh, please feel free to tweet us at Guten Inc. or at LeadsRx if you have additional questions or need anything else. As I mentioned, just wanted to do, um, oh, sorry. I guess, Frank, can we get you muted on there? We're hearing some background noise. I, there we go. All right, I think we're all good. Um, okay, wanted to introduce you guys to AJ Brown. As I mentioned, he is the CEO and co-founder of Leads RX. AJ, thank you so much for joining us today and um, would love to learn a little bit more about you and about Leads RX if you want to just kind of give us uh, the elevator pitch and the quick and dirty. You bet. Thank you, Alexandra. Appreciate being here today. <clears throat> I don't know how many of you have heard about uh, attribution technology. It's sort of a new area for some online retailers, but it really is, is old school kind of metrics. Um, real quickly about LeadsRx, we are a software company and we provide an attribution platform that's really designed for e-commerce right out of the box. We connect in with Shopify seamlessly. We're up and tracking your orders within seconds. Uh, but we also work with other types of businesses as well. Um, there's three main things that differentiate us from the competition out there. Everything we do is in real time. We have what we call a universal conversion tracking pixel that does the, the hard work for us there. Um, and we're constantly monitoring the state of your orders. So it's a system that kind of always runs in the background and checks out what's going on, how buyers are coming to find your, your storefronts and become buyers, monitors lifetime value and things like that. We'll talk more about this in detail, of course. And most importantly is that what we do is, is what we call full funnel and cross-channel attribution. Not to throw a bunch of fancy terms there into the mix, but the, the idea behind that is we're tracking complete customer journeys years at a time. We're doing that across all your different uh, value points uh, and the ways that you communicate with clients. But let me take a step back and really talk about attribution and how this might play a role for your online store. I think everything starts with this quote that many of you have probably seen way too many times in your marketing career, in your business life. And this was by John Wanamaker, who was a, a merchant and a, a considered sort of the father of advertising back at the turn of the century. He was quoted as saying that half the money I spend on advertising is wasted. Problem is, I don't know which half. And that's a common issue that we see among pretty much all of our customers. Uh, a lot of them start advertising, say on Facebook and Google, maybe they throw in some Instagram ads, and things seem to pick up, they get more orders, but they're not really sure which of those advertising channels is really you know, drawing in the lion's share of those new customers. And there's technologies from each of those vendors. Facebook has what's called a a conversion pixel, maybe you're aware of that. Google has one as well. And these are what things you can put on your, on your storefront to help understand if Facebook ads are in fact leading to new orders or not. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't really solve the problem. It only uh, mounts a bigger issue, which is how do you arbitrate between Google saying, I get credit for this conversion versus Facebook saying, I get credit for the order and so on. So I think John's quote stands, which is many people out there who are spending money on advertising uh, realize that it's not clear to them that 100% of it is paying off. Some portion of it is, is being wasted. <clears throat> and the trouble is they just simply don't know. One industry statistic that I, that I use quite a bit is that people now estimate that 60% of digital advertising's uh, money that's spent on digital advertising is wasted every day. 
60% is a huge number to say it's wasted. Um, and attribution is going to help you kind of understand where that problem is and how to get rid of it. But I'm going to take another step back here and talk really about how most online stores get started in the first place. And it's not with paid advertising. That usually comes a little later. What I see with many new storefronts <clears throat> is they spend an awful lot of time getting great pictures of their products, writing wonderful descriptions, building their storefront, and getting it launched. Um, it really revolves around the product offering and the uh, design of their storefront that really is, is the most appealing part of this project about getting it out the door. And often people will put introductory sale prices in place, maybe a promo code, you know, our first store is launched, you know, buy today, you'll get 20% off. Primarily the, 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 the typical way that, that they drive traffic to their store is just telling friends and family. It's word of mouth. Hey, I opened my new store and it's called um, you know, mycellphonecase.com. I have a friend of mine, and she started a store called Seven Continents Art on Shopify, oh, I guess about a year ago now. And she actually has a group of friends who have traveled to the seven continents around the world. They pick up unusual art, they take some original photographs, and then they sell them on the storefront. And I remember when she first launched it, <clears throat> she said, hey, my new store is open. It's called uh, Seven Continents Art uh, Dash with dashes instead of um, instead of dots. And it's got my Shopify in there somewhere. And I think it's got .com. And she really had a hard time <laughs> even conveying to me what the name of her store was. And that's not uncommon. Um, so you lose a little bit there in the process is my point. And you may think that word of mouth is a great way to, to kind of get started. And it is, it's the typical way that many stores get launched, but it may not be the best way to promote traffic to your, to your business. So what usually happens next, is that people start doing social marketing, social posts. They get into Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and so on. They try to get their page likes increased. They built a beautiful page in Facebook, uh, for example, and get all the photographs in there and all their, all their information is great. <clears throat> and they'll start making posts that, hey, we're open for business, click here to, to, to buy something today. And if you're really lucky, you get other people to make posts on your behalf where they retweet and they repost what you posted. And that stuff is gold, right? So when your network picks up you know, your store opening, they see it, see something you did on Instagram and they repost it, that's, that's awesome, right? You want to get more followers and more information out there as possible. That does increase sales, of course, but really what happens next in the life cycle of many storefronts is that we start talking about search engines. How do we get Google to index our store? <clears throat> How do we get Google to send traffic to my storefront? This is really very, very difficult. And the reason is it takes what's called you know, search engine optimization or SEO techniques to find a set of keywords that are relevant to your store offerings and embed those keywords throughout your website, throughout your storefront. And that can be real challenging. Maybe you have you know, 20 products, maybe you have 100 different products. How do you embed those same keywords everywhere? How do you make relevant content that doesn't kind of screw up or mess up your core messaging for each of those products? But that's literally what you, what you have to do. You have to sit down and decide, how are you gonna optimize your site? What are, what are the keywords you're gonna choose? And at this stage, we see a lot of storefronts start adding more to their stores, adding more descriptions, more overview, a bigger about page. In many cases, they add a blog, and that's a great thing to do. Blogs are wonderful ways to stuff a lot of keywords in and a lot of content without disrupting the flow of people buying things and putting them in their shopping cart. So it kind of offloads all of that messy keyword uh, conversation by putting it in a blog, and it still has SEO value because Google and the other search engines do indeed pick that up, uh, and it doesn't disrupt the quality of the of the information you have about your products. If you're really AJ, geeky, with the blogs, have you seen that to be actually a uh, like a a good a good uh, thing that people can do with their stores? Absolutely, yeah, we see that quite a bit. In fact, we, we worked with one retailer who, whose marketing program was almost 100% based on blog articles. And they would write articles about you know, customers that have used their products, they would allow customers to submit stories. You know, a lot of times we collect reviewers of our merchandise and those can be turned into blog articles real easily. And interestingly, when you, when you have somebody review a product of yours, they tend to use the keywords that they use to find you in the first place. And so it's a self-fulfilling mission. If you take those review uh, quotes even and put them in a blog or expand upon them by interviewing one of your customers, it can add significant value to finding more people uh, like that to come to your store. 
Yeah, that's a really excellent point because I think sometimes that we think of, oh, people are are searching for this because this is the jargon that we talk about um, within our own our own organizations. But it's very interesting to see how others in their reviews are actually talking about us, and that's what um, their you know their peers are looking for. So Agreed. that's a great point. I think if you're really geeky, you'll also install what's called a search console from Google, Google Search Console, and I highly recommend it. It, it is a little geeky, uh, so I apologize. I don't know why I'm apologizing for Google, but it's a pretty cool tool, and it will help you significantly increase the search value of your web, of your storefront. So take a look at that if you haven't. <clears throat> but lastly, though, I think the, the, the last thing we typically do as merchants is we start paying for advertising. So we kind of want to get all the free things out of the way. We launch the store through word of mouth. We get social posting because we can do that at no charge. We optimize the website and our storefront with blog articles and reviewers and other text. And then finally, we break down and say, okay, it's time to put a budget together. Maybe we'll spend $100. Maybe we'll spend $10,000 in a month. It really doesn't matter. You just want to get the wheels turning somewhere there. Most retailers start with Facebook. There's just no question. It seems to be a great tool for advertising. One of the reasons for that is Facebook allows you to specify very granular information about the types of people that you want to target with your ads. So rather than just have your ads show up to thousands of people who don't care, if you have products, say, for tennis uh, enthusiasts, you can find on Facebook people who play tennis. Um, by that activity specifically, you can look for gender and age groups and so on, even geographic locations. And so your ad dollars go a little further on Facebook because of that. No offense to Google, Google's a great tool as well. And you can certainly go to Google and use AdWords. Somebody told me one day, the problem with Google AdWords is Amazon spends about $13 million every day advertising their products. And as you know, Google is a bidding platform. So the merchant with the highest bid for an advertisement means that their ad's gonna get served. Can any of us really compete against $13 million every day that Amazon's spending on hundreds of thousands of products? Probably not. So again, I'm not saying don't go there with Google. People do, and it can often work because you have a unique product offering of some sort, and you've done great with your SEO and all the things that come before that. <clears throat> the bottom line is when you put all of this together, finally you're going to see your sales take off. You'll start seeing sales ramp up. You'll see all of these things happen. It said, great, something here is working. Right? I've got the word of mouth going, I've got social referrals going, I've got search engines finding me and sending me traffic, and my ad people, people are clicking on my ads. Guess what? It is working. I'm getting more sales than I got a week ago. That, of course, begs the biggest question of all. <laughs> Great. If I'm getting more sales, what's working? Which of those items in that path was working best? How do I get more sales? What do I do next? If I've got another $500 or $1,000 to now spend on advertising or on marketing and in general, where do I put it? Do I hire an SEO person to come optimize my site even more? Do I pay a blogger to write articles about my, my merchants, uh, merchandise and get more referrals? Where does that money really get allocated? <clears throat> well, let's go back to this chart. That's where attribution comes into play. Attribution is all about connecting the dots between your marketing touch points and your orders, your customers. It is not about tracking visitors to your website. So if you've used Google Analytics, for example, as a tool, or just some of the dashboard capabilities that you'll find in Shopify, it's great at telling you you had you know, 200 unique visitors in the last week, and 40% of those came from California, and 20% of those you know, came from Sacramento, something like that. You'll get some interesting insights about your visitor traffic but visitors are not buyers. I don't know if you know this, but Google, for example, when you have Google ads running, 98% of the people who click on those ads never become buyers. It's a 98% failure rate is what we say. So about 2%, if you're lucky, 2% will buy your product. And that can be higher or lower depending on you know, how well targeted your service is and maybe it's a real compelling product. Maybe you're gonna get 5%, which means 95% of the visitor traffic is wrong. They're not buying your product. So analyzing visitor traffic is great, but it's wrong. You don't need more visitors. What you need is more buyers. And what attribution does is it analyzes only the buyers to show you how they came to find your company. So step one in using attribution is all about understanding your touch points. And a touch point is just how a consumer comes in contact with your brand, your company's name. 
<clears throat> so back to that picture I showed you earlier, let's replace this with touch points. When we launched that store and started using word of mouth to get people to come to our URL, to our storefront, they came directly. We call that a direct visit, right? They typed in the URL 7-continents-art-myshopify.com. That's how that person ended up at the storefront. That's a direct visit. And that's a touch point, an important touch point. Social posting, those are referrals, right? So we make a post on Facebook or Instagram. Somebody clicks through, they end up on our storefront. What happens is we consider that a referred source. Somebody was referred from Facebook or Twitter um, to come to our storefront. Maybe somebody read a blog by a third party blogger who reviewed your product and said, it's greatest products in sliced bread. You gotta buy this tennis racket. Click here to get more information on it. That would be called a social referral. Another common touch point is the organic search. So the, all that SEO work we did, optimize for keywords, adding our blog, writing more text, what that, what that eventually leads to is the fact when I go to Google and say, I'm looking for tennis rackets, that Google is hopefully gonna show your website, not an advertisement, but a, a link to your website, to your storefront. And if somebody clicks on that, we call that touch point the organic search touch point. And then lastly, advertising, that's paid advertising. You can do that everywhere, Facebook, Google, Instagram, LinkedIn, you can put display ads anywhere you want, basically these days on the internet. Email marketing might be another form of paid advertising. So step one is really understand what touch points you are currently using. There's probably more than you know. One of our early customers had over 650 different touch points, many of which they never even knew about. Okay? All they were able to analyze was visitor traffic. Once they started analyzing buyer traffic, they uncovered the fact that there were a lot more touch points that they never even considered. <clears throat> Step two is take those touch points and organize them for each of your customers into what we call a customer journey map. And this isn't that complicated, but it really says for each and every buyer, each and every customer, what was the series of touch points over time that we believe influenced them to buy the product? So here's an example. Let's say somebody saw that, that social post you did on Facebook and they clicked through to come to your, your storefront, they look at all your products, but they went away and they didn't buy. Right? So that first touch point was when they clicked through from your, your, your post. Maybe a few days later, they saw a third party blog article written about that same product. And they said, you know what, I, I saw that the other day, I'm gonna click through again. So they click back, they get another referral source back to your storefront and they, they look at a few more products, but they also go away. Not really interested at this point. <clears throat> Something changes though, and they decide, you know what, I saw that tennis racket a couple of weeks ago. And I remember the name of the site. I'm going to go back directly to their website, right? It's called tennisrackets.com, perhaps. They get to your storefront through a direct touch point. They still don't buy. They go away. They come back maybe a month later through organic search. They go to Google, say, you know, I really need to get a new tennis racket. Mine's busted. It's 30 years old and, and, and decrepit. It's made out of wood, for crying out loud. So they get on Google and they type in tennis rackets. And lo and behold, Google puts up an organic search result for your storefront. They click on that which by the way is one of the best sources of customers ever. They click on that, they come to your storefront, they still don't buy, but guess what? They saw a retargeting ad for that tennis racket. They click on that and they buy. Now that's an elongated example. It doesn't always happen with this many touch points in, some, in consumer markets. We see this more in, in sort of business markets in particular or consumer markets where there's a long buying cycle. You know, you may find that somebody just does an organic search, comes to your website and buys immediately or buys the next day. But if you're selling cars, for example, automobiles, this is, this is the kind of path you're gonna see. If you're selling, even frankly, even tennis rackets may take a little longer. Sometimes that's a very personal item. People wanna review it. They wanna look at how this tennis racket compares to other ones they've been looking at. They may wanna go into a retailer, a brick and mortar store, see the tennis racket before they come back online and look to buy it for less money, they think. Another My area, that you probably see this as well, is when people don't even know that they need or want the thing that you're offering. Uh, so, you know, it's the their first uh, touch point is not, I need a tennis racket, but oh, I, I didn't even realize, yes, that, you know, I did enjoy tennis 10 years ago. I should start getting back into that. Um, so so that, you know, laying the foundation for, for um, increasing someone's wants. You can definitely see a longer customer journey and, and more touch points. That's an excellent point. We call that the uh, customer buying cycles. And often we talk about customers who are unaware that there's an issue. Like you said, Alexander, they're unaware that they even need a tennis racket. Uh, but the next phase is we create a little pain point. 
still using a wooden tennis racket, you know how much that's affecting your tennis elbow, causing you uh, troubles in your body. It's not having as much power as the new aluminum rackets or, or carbon uh, rackets, for example. So you can take, take the buyer through a series of phases to help educate them and increase their pain, intensify it before you present a solution. Exactly right. So anyway, step two is to collect these customer journey maps and really understand how every buyer comes to become a buyer. How do they start? How do they finish? And of course, if you've got you know, four customers a week, this is a pretty simple process to do. When you have 400 customers a week, it's not so easy. Let me go back. The last step then, step three in my how do you get started with attribution uh, story is to give credit where credit's due. So let's just take that same customer journey map. Let's say the customer bought that tennis racket for $100. So on the far right there, at the end, end, of, the, end of the day, they paid $100 for that racket. What attribution does is it goes back then and says, let's, let's dole out that $100 and give credit to each of the touch points that were involved. And there's lots of methodologies for how you do that. But in this case, I would say, let's give you know, $20 credit to each of the five touch points that were in this particular customer journey map. Okay? So what that does for me is it instantly tells me that I'm getting certain dollar value from each of these touch points. So I know if I spend money, on enhancing these touch points, I know that I need to spend less than I'm getting back, right? If I want to return on my spending, if, um, I want to make sure that I'm getting more revenue at the end of the day than I'm, than I'm spending on that channel. So how you do that is you come up with this sort of what I call the final analysis. Take your touch points, put them in a chart, itemize them out, and add up the credit over all customers. Here, with, this, with just this simple one customer example, we saw there were two touch points that were social referrals, each had $20 credit, so the summation is $40 credit. Direct business gets $20, organic search 20, and paid advertising 20. That's just a very simplistic model, but it gives you the idea that you say, in this case, for this customer, the social referrals was the most important touch point, right? It was twice as important as any other touch point. And I might be willing to spend $30 to enhance my social referral capability by paying a blogger to write about my product, for example, or maybe hiring a blogger to write an article on my own blog site, whatever that is, I'll spend $30 because I know I'm going to make $40 from that channel if the, if the mathematics play out. Now, of course, you can't take one customer as an example and really make a business decision about that. But what you can do, oh, by the way, we call this multi-touch attribution. Right? This is where the phrase comes in. We're taking every touch point into consideration. But what you can do is keep doing this, what we call at scale, across all buyers over all time. That's when you'll start seeing some very interesting patterns emerge. What you thought was working for one set of customers, the first few customers, may not at all be what really is working for the masses. And you know what? Seasonality matters. What happens over the holiday time or back to school time is completely different than at other times of the year. What happens over weekends is often different than weekdays. There's lots of ways to kind of slice and dice the data. My point of that is attribution is an ongoing monitoring capability. It's not a one-shot deal. Don't use an attribution product for a week and say, okay, I figured out my answer. Here's where I need to put my, my advertising dollars. I can, I can leave it behind now and cancel my account. No, attribution is something you want to use as a monitoring tool. It's always looking at your marketing programs and your customer touch points to decide how credit should be given out. Look at this example. It's a little more complicated, but as time goes on, this is what you'll do. Instead of just, look, you'll start by saying, hey, social referrals it's, gets $40 credit. But then you'll start breaking it out. You say, well, how about social referrals versus bloggers? Or maybe just referrals from other you know, affiliate websites if you're using any kind of affiliate marketing. Another example, you'll break out organic search between Google and Bing, maybe Yahoo. If you start to do paid advertising, you might want to break it out. Instead of just lumping it under one category of paid advertising, you'll break it out by Facebook, by Google, by your display ads, by email marketing, by whatever other ad programs you're paying for, you can break it out and get more granular as time goes on. I don't recommend that as one of the first three steps, right? The first three steps are get your touch points identified, build customer journey maps, right? And then give credit where credit's due. Just start that. That's a simple first step to take. Then as you evolve, start adding greater detail. Start drilling down like this and see how the things kind of play out. <clears throat> so just quickly in summary, that's what attribution is all about. There's basically four things that it's, that it's going to do for you. Identify all your touch points that automatically will find out how people are finding your storefront and not just people, but people who buy. It's going to collect customer journeys across all touch points. 
Attribution software will automatically collect those touch points. You don't have to do that. It's gonna build these customer journey maps. You can see them. You can log into an attribution product and visually see what the maps look like, but it's gonna do it, um, in a, it for automatically for you without your involvement. Attribution, of course, is gonna give credit to each touch point involved in, this, in that sale. Um, and of course, there's a little bit of, there's some uh, tools you have usually to tweak that. So you can use different attribution models, right? And what I showed you is called a linear multi-touch attribution model. Long phrase, but it basically means for that $100 we, we got for the sale of the tennis racket, I gave the same amount to each touch point. I gave $20 to each of the five touch points. There's other models like a weighted model that would change that or first touch or last touch. I think Alexander is gonna talk about that in a second. And then lastly, attribution performs at scale. The important thing here is we all want our business to grow. We wanna get more clients, we want more buyers every single day. And so this attribution tools are exactly what you need to do this sort of in the background on an ongoing basis with as many buyers as you'll ever have. And I put up that article about Forbes. You know, it's two years old at this point and it still rings true. If you, when CMOs at major companies, major retailers and small businesses are interviewed, one of the top things they'll always present as a challenge is attribution. How do we maximize our marketing initiatives? How do we really understand what we're spending money on? And number two, on this list of this particular Forbes article was getting a unified view of customers. That's the customer journey map. That's all what that customer journey map is about. How do we get a unified view of what our customers are doing? Not visitors, but customers. With that, I'll toss it back to Alexandra. See if yeah, yeah, this, is, uh, this has been wonderful. And I actually, um, as I was going through your presentation beforehand, um, put together some more slides that really would love to pick your brain and um, and, and benefit again from from your your knowledge, AJ, and and from what you've done um, with Leads RX. So one of the questions that we often have as marketers, and I think you touched on it a little bit, um, is you know what is the right attribution model for your e-commerce business? So if you read an article about it, there's first touch, last touch, assists, view through, um, equal weighting or linear, you know, and W shaped. There, the list continues to go on. Um, when you are working with uh, different e-commerce businesses, what do you typically recommend? And what are some of the, the pitfalls of, uh, for example, first touch and, and last touch? Yeah, I think you can uh, look at a lot of different models as my first answer. Don't, don't just assume one model is going to fit all. First touch is great for telling us kind of where the consumer originally came from. We all kind of want to know what was the original source for this person. And it's just a data point, right? It tells us that, you know, Google found all my, most of my customers. So I like first touch a lot just because it kind of tells me that, but you have to put some time limits on it. So first touch is great, but is it great if the person came a year ago through some channel that no longer exists? So a lot of attribution products give you the ability to set what's called a look back period and say, hey, we only want to look back six months. Anything older than six months is no longer relevant. The digital world changes too much. My marketing's changing too much. Let's not just put, make first touch, you know, historically the first touch. Let's make it the first touch within the last six months. So I think one of the pitfalls of using first touch is we get hung up on it and we put too much emphasis on outdated information. And even more than what, that. I would, yeah. I would say uh, with first touch, that's assigning 100%. So you gave that example of maybe the $100 tennis racket. Even though that um, consumer took five or six different steps, um, it, I think if I remember correctly, it was a referral, maybe a social post. You would then say, oh, that social post was $100 and all of the other things along the way are basically obsolete. So Correct. you might be missing out on a lot of uh, a lot of the journey of your of your customers, um, and and potentially not seeing uh, the forest for for the trees. Yeah, excellent point. Couldn't agree more. I think the one model that we talk a lot about with e-commerce companies uh, <clears throat> happens when they start doing what's called display advertising which for a lot of stores is an advanced advertising technique. It's not the first thing they do out the gate. But for example, uh, there's the whole industry of what's called programmatic ad buying these days. And that's the system where you can say, I'm targeting you know, tennis buyers who are men between 25 and 30 in North America. And then these programmatic ad buying engines 
go out and say, okay, well, you know, I happen to know Forbes magazine reaches that target, so I'm gonna go ahead and serve your ads on Forbes magazine. And if it doesn't work, over the course of a few days, they stop serving on Forbes automatically and they pick a different publication. So they're kind of cool, but what happens is <clears throat> these kind of display ads, what we're finding is that consumers more and more are having what we call click uh, avo uh, avoidance. They don't want to click on ads anymore, even if they see them on Facebook, but these display ads in particular. So they see a display ad on the internet. Let's say they do see it on Forbes website and rather than click on it, they'll look for the URL and they'll go to Google and they'll type it in tennisrackets.com and they'll go to the website directly. We call that a view through um, attribution point. We think they saw the ad. We know they came directly shortly thereafter and then they bought the product. So we want to make sure the credit's given where credit is due in this case. Normal systems would say, well, they didn't click on the ad, so darn it all, the ad was useless. And I say, no, what we see all the time in our customer journey maps, all the time, is these impressions being served, but nobody clicks on them. And they'll do a search or they'll do a direct visit instead. So that view through one is one you don't want to ignore. If you get to that point of doing uh, uh, view, uh, display ads around the internet, then really strongly consider view through attribution. That's a great point. And that probably also uh, backs on cross device as well, which could be probably its own webinar in and of itself. <laughs> yes, of course. Yes. All right, why don't we uh, flip to the, the next one? So if you're uh, an e-commerce business and just getting started with attribution, um, what would you kind of look at for the basics? I think you've really, you've uh, dived into this uh, pretty well, but any technology you should be using, um, looking at certain return on ad spend, any, anything that, that you would recommend? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I hate to push our own product, but I will very quickly here. LeadsRx is a great platform for e-com providers. You can sign up from the Shopify app store. We have a completely free version of the product that does everything I've talked about here today at no charge. Um, the only thing we don't do is analyze the depth of your paid advertising. So we'll analyze all your free channels for you at no charge, things like social referrals, direct visits, organic search, and so on. Um, so if you're doing heavy paid advertising, you'll need to pay for our product, but basically you can use it for free if you're not. So start with that because it's gonna show you and illuminate for you everything we've talked about, the customer journey maps, the touch points that you're using, um, and, and kind of how to give credit out. And I think that technology piece is your first step. Second step with technology is don't forget that Google search console. I can't say enough positive about that. I, I can't say for sure, but there seems to be a connection that when I start using Google search console for a new store or a, just a website, seems like within about a week, search traffic starts increasing. And I'm not suggesting that Google you know, knows I'm using their tool and they want me to see more search results, <clears throat> but there seems to be some crossover between my use of that tool and more people coming to my, my websites by searches. And I can't stress how important searches are. Consumers, I think, like to find things on their own. When they do an organic search for you know, tennis rackets um, made from aluminum and they find your company, they think, aha, I found a little gem. I found a company nobody else probably knows about. I'm going to buy the product. And then they go tell the world about it. So organic search traffic is huge. Absolutely take some time to install Google Search Console. There's no charge. It's a completely free product. So both with LeadsRx and organic search, you can get started with basics and the technology real quickly without any extra cost out of your pocket. But the return on ad spend piece that Alexandra mentioned is so important. What you, what you want to do there is just kind of start instilling the practice that says, I'm only going to spend $1,000 on advertising if I can measure it, if I can measure the success. I know so many marketers, marketers who have huge budgets, right? We had one online retailer that had a $400,000 a month budget, large amount of money, and they had no clue where to spend it. So they, they, we, we do, they, they did what I call spray and, and pray. They sprayed it around different channels, and they just hoped that something would benefit the company. And it did, but they couldn't tell what. So think about return on the ad spend with everything you do. It should be a constant state of mind that says every dollar you spend on advertising needs to, needs to be able to be measured. It doesn't need to be paid back because you might you know, pick a channel that just simply doesn't work, but you won't know that unless you measure it. So make sure measurement is a part of your methodology from day one. Great, yes, definitely. 
Okay, so you were talking, I'm really glad that you uh, got in with your presentation kind of beyond organic and paid advertising. You're talking about things like content and reviews. So I think a lot of times in attribution, we think about things that we pay for. So we think about, oh, that Facebook ad cost us you know, $1.65 or whatever the case may be. And we uh, say, I really need to make sure that I make that money back. But what we don't always think about is our own bandwidth and kind of time and what we're, you know, a lot of people running small businesses, they only have so much of it or even big businesses. Um, so how do you, uh, how do you take that into consideration? And is that really important in your, your attribution model of as far as should you be focusing on some things that are, are kind of the things like reviews and content and, and yeah. other pieces like that? Yeah, very definitely. I think reviews, you know, we all want reviews for our product. And of course, there's a risk in, in asking for them. Some people may not enjoy the product. But at the end of the day, it's going to pay off because it's that SEO value that's hard to get otherwise. And as we talked about earlier, getting a review in the in the customer's language, you know, when they use the same keywords that they search for, and that happens time and time again, that's just awesome. You know, I saw one company that that takes reviews, but they have a minimum that you have to have 150 characters, I think, to the review. And that may seem silly, but what that does is it stops the people from saying, crappy product, don't buy it. <laughs> if you have to write 150 characters, more likely than not, you start finding the positive reviewers who want to take the time, and they'll use more of those keywords, and they'll add more SEO value for you. So find ways to get longer reviews, and then you know what you guys got to do is, is make sure the reviews are visible. I see so many e-commerce sites that put the reviews at the bottom of the product page, way below the add to cart button. That's not gonna help anybody buy. You need to put some on the home page, right? They need to be right up front. And I know you gotta open up your storefront and do that manually, so what? That's where the human capital comes in that Alexander mentioned. Your time is important to this equation. You just can't just pay for everything. It's gonna to have to be manual work in some cases. So put those reviews around where they really matter. With the blog articles and content that you do, you know, the common problem here is people think, well, nobody has read my blog, right? It's just a blog article. Don't forget. So first I'll say, don't forget the SEO value that the blog has because the search engine read it, guaranteed, and that's the most important thing. But also, you can include blog reads in your attribution models. So the customer touch points I showed you in the earlier example, one of those touch points could be, could be blog article number 65 about the tennis racket. And the attribution models will pick that up and show you that that blog article was commonly being seen in the attribution path. So again, your hard personal work at writing that blog article, which nobody enjoys doing, frankly, right? Trying to come up with 800 characters, making it SEO value, formatting it right, correcting spelling errors, it's a hassle. But when it starts showing up in the attribution paths, it's now a selling point, it's a touch point. And what's cool about that is when you find out which blogs are commonly showing in the touch points, what are you gonna do next? You're gonna add a, a call to action button in that blog, click here to buy now. I, I rarely, if ever, see that and it surprises me because your blogs, if people are willing to read it and they're showing up in the version pass, is one of your best touch points ever and it's free. Put a button, buy the tennis racket now, click here, add to cart. Again, it's, it's manual work, but you can do it. And it's something that's evergreen. I mean, the number of blog yeah. posts that I've seen written that may be you know, two years old that continue uh, to increase in the number of views and conversions and um, you know it pays dividends. So it may seem like a real pain uh, at the time, but it's one of those things that, that continues to bear fruit. Agreed. Uh, do we have more? One more, there we go. Yeah, uh, yeah I, think this is, I think this is my last one. Uh, so you know, we all know, okay, that first point of sale, like yay, they've become a customer. Um, great, now we can attribute back to their whole journey. But how do we look at the importance of the LTV, so LTV meaning lifetime value, and um, and repeat sales? We all you know, don't want a customer to just buy something from us once, we want them to buy from us you know, twice, five, 10 times. Uh, how do you recommend that? Well, you're again, 100% right, because often the, the list of touch points that's involved in a first time buyer are completely different than the touch points in a repeat buyer. So for example, the email drip marketing that a lot of, uh, a lot of you folks do up here uh, is what brings back buyers to buy uh, the product again, right? You know, get another, get another pair of shoes for half off or whatever the promotion is. 
So you need to be able to analyze that data separately. So look for attribution tools that segregate and segment new buyers versus repeat buyers. Uh, and, and so you can see the attribution models and how they're, how they're different. But Alexander, you're 100% right again that tracking that LTV, the lifetime value of a customer is really important. Here's why. We have another company that sells a product for um, $80. And as it turns out, the average cost to acquire a new customer was $74. So that gave them $6 of gross profit. Of course, their product cost about $60 to manufacture, so they were losing 50, 50 plus dollars on every sale. It wasn't until they looked at the lifetime value calculation that it started to pay off because this was a repeat purchase product. And as people bought their second uh, copy of the product and third copy and so on, all of a sudden the lifetime value was up over $200, $300, and all those at that high cost of acquisition started to pay off. And the cost of getting a repeat customer is dramatically different than getting a first time customer. So while they were spending 70 some odd dollars to get the customer the first time, they were paying less than $5 to get them to buy the product again. And I think you'll see the same thing, but you have to look at the total lifetime value. What are the total amount of, of sales that have been uh, uh, done, paid for by each customer? And again, that's something your attribution tool set should be able to do for you. Perfect. Yeah, this is this has been great. I would love to uh, open up the uh, the questions and answers now that you've you've answered all of my pressing questions. I, I <laughs> uh, be be a little bit uh, less selfish and and ask uh, the audience. Uh, Frank, do we have any questions from our from our great audience today? We do. We have a few that came in here. Um, good one to start out with. Um, from Tom, how do you know if your channel isn't working or if you didn't set it up or optimize it correctly? What are the factors that you look to? Well, I'll tell you, the um, I, I, this varies from attribution tool to attribution tool. So I'm gonna tell you the good news from LeadsRx perspective, you can't set it up wrong. We, our system automatically finds the touch point. So if you forget to to put a tag on your ad destination URL, we're gonna find it anyway, for example. Um, other tools, maybe not so much, but that, that said, it's still very important that you always get in the practice of putting what's called tracking parameters on your advertisements. So if you put an ad on Facebook, rather than just send it to you know, tennisrackets.com, you're gonna say send it to tennisrackets.com, question mark, UTM source equals Facebook. Right? That's called a tracking parameter. UTM underscore source is a common parameter that Google had defined. And in this case, we're setting the value to the word Facebook. What that does is allows attribution tools to more easily and more accurately pick up that information. Once we've done that, and you should do that across the board, don't ever write your URL anywhere ever without putting a tracking parameter best advice you can get today. And you can shorten those parameters so they're a lot easier. Yes, uh, for example, some tools will allow you to say, you know, A equals one, A equals three, A equals four, make it as short as you want. And of course you can use a URL minifier if you want to as well. But once you're doing that, then how do you know if a, if a channel's not working? It's very simple, it won't show up in your attribution models. So if you look at say a linear or multi-touch attribution model of any type, and let's say you're paying for those Facebook ads, they simply won't show. They'll be at the bottom of the list that says zero credit has been given to this channel. And we call that wasted ad spend. You're spending money on that, but you're not getting any revenue back. So if that trend continues for very long, you'll want to turn off that program. You can also see if that trend is about to occur or that, that, that outcome is about to occur. So for example, we have situations where we see lots and lots of people clicking on Facebook ads. And so it's kind of going up and to the right, right? You see more and more people clicking as the weeks go on, but fewer and fewer people are actually buying the product after they click. So we see click-throughs trending upwards. We see orders trending down from those clicks, which tells us the ad is probably getting fatigued and that channel may be wearing out. And that's very common in social channels in particular. So the, what you do as a marketer is you say, okay, I'm gonna stop it before it tanks and goes to zero. I already see the trend is going down significantly versus the clicks. I don't wanna keep paying for clicks if they aren't gonna buy the product. So I'm gonna stop that ad. I'm gonna refresh the creative effort or the call to action and maybe try again in a couple of weeks. Okay. All right, terrific, thank you. Uh, another one here, 
how do I incorporate my offline PR campaigns to drive online activity? And how can I include that into my attribution model? So um, I'll, I'll talk from our tool perspective again, because it's what I know the best. We have the ability where you can upload offline uh, data. So for example, let's say you go to a trade show in Las Vegas for tennis rackets, just to stay on my, my story there. And you start talking to a bunch of people in, in your trade show booth and you're handing out business cards. And let's say you take their business card. Somebody says, you know, I really want to consider, maybe they want to wholesale your tennis rackets that you make and put them in their retail store. So what you can do is then when you come back home, you can take that list of names that you've collected and email addresses, and you literally just put it in a spreadsheet file, a CSV file, you upload it in our product. And now we have that email captured. And if we see that person on your website at some point with that same email address later kind of buying your product, we know that you also touched them in the sense at that trade show that became a, an active touch point. You can upload any data you want. In fact, we have a couple of customers that don't even use our, our online system at all. All they do is upload data from call center data and from print advertisements that they've done and things like that. So there's lots of, you know, it's very simple to kind of include that offline marketing touch point in your online uh, digital world. Frank? All right, fantastic. Um, Let's see here, we have another one. Do you have advice for how to dig deeper into direct visit referrals? No, not really. It's very difficult. You're dealing with the human psyche at that point. So when somebody just types in your URL, uh, we don't really know if they, if they typed it in manually or did they copy it from a email message and paste it, because that would show up as a direct visit, or maybe they bookmarked it you know, from some from uh, an earlier visit. Maybe they clicked on a Facebook ad, came to your website, then they put a bookmark there and they came back. That's gonna look like a direct visit. All we know is that the consumer somehow maintained information about your company and that's what's important. It may not be important that they had a bookmark or they copy and pasted it, but the point is they took the time, <laughs> you know, in a sense to type in that address bar. Isn't that the hardest thing we do on websites these days is type in that that, that name in an, in an address bar. Clicking on an ad or something like that is a lot easier. So for people to do that, it tells me it's a pretty valuable touch point. I tend to associate direct visits with brand recognition. I think as my storefront gets to be known, tennisrackets.com, and people start coming to it directly, it means that the brand value is, is, is out there and people are, understand the name and they just kind of come to it. AJ, in those, in those cases, would you then look at what you were doing overall from a marketing strategy or, or kind of a, a brand strategy and assign some attribution to, to some of those pieces so that you weren't yeah, you, too myopic? Yeah, you sure could. I would. So we, for example, in our system, you would put in a category that says brand advertising and you can put a dollar amount that you've spent there and then spread that out over things like direct visitors. So that way you say, hey, I believe that the people that have come directly have heard my brand or seen my brand somewhere. We also do that with radio advertising and TV advertising. So if you get into that area with your storefront, you know, how do you know if somebody heard the radio ad? You don't. But what we see is we analyze a lot of data for radio broadcasters is that within a window of time, after a radio ad airs, people do indeed come to the website directly. They also come from organic search, but mostly directly. So let's say you have a radio ad that says, hey, we're now offering tennis rackets for 20% off. Come to tennisrackets.com today to buy your racket. What happens is within about a 10 minute window after that ad finishes, we see a spike in traffic. We actually see a spike at minute two and it tails off by minute 15, right? So 10 minutes is just a, a typical length of time. So a direct visit can also mean that they, you know, heard a, heard a radio broadcast ad or they saw a TV commercial or maybe they saw a billboard. As you get more advanced with your offline programs like that, direct visits can actually be related. Very interesting. Yeah. Any more any more questions, Frank, for AJ? Um, looks like we have one more. Do your social posts have any influence on SEO? Much. Um, not. It's. It's no. Not. To, not to my knowledge. <clears throat> and the reason it depends. <laughs> Let me say. I'll, I'll change my answer. Um, if if you put a social post on Facebook, does it have any SEO value for your website? Not directly. Um, you know, Google's not in the practice of going to Facebook pages, indexing that content, and then referring it to your website. Those two companies don't necessarily get along all that greatly. 
However, if you have a system on your website with a social post feed, right, which you can integrate your most recent five posts from Facebook can be shown up on your storefront, then yes. When Google's bot comes to your website to index it and it reads that post that's being shown, it's gonna pick that up. Those do have SEO value, but you need that integration step. You need to be able to integrate the feed from your social streams somewhere on your website. I always recommend put it in the foot of the page, that way it's on every page. Um, but I think some people would tell you, probably just put it in one spot like the homepage. So I'd, I would do further research on that first. All right, terrific. It looks like that covers uh, all the questions that we have right now. AJ, thank you so much. Uh, I know that I've learned a lot and I'm sure our attendees have as well. Um, thank you so much for, for spending an hour of your, your day with us. And thanks to everyone who is on the webinar. Again, uh, we will be sending this out. If anyone had other questions, please feel free to reach out uh, to AJ. AJ, do you want to give them your, your email address or should they just come to leadsrx.com? Oh, you can write me directly. It's just AJ at leadsrx.com. Perfect. And if anyone has, has questions for me too, I'm Alexandra at guten.com um, or on Twitter. You can, you can tweet me at Gibson DM. Uh, so thank you guys and have a great rest of your, is it Tuesday? A great rest of your Tuesday and a great rest of your week. <laughs>